TFM. Welcome, Stargazers, to another episode of the Artificial Tango, our dedicated Star Trek Picard podcast. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as he always is, is my esteemed co-host, Matthew Rushing. And Matthew, I know you've been favoring whiskey during our recent recordings, but today I brought you a bottle of sour mead. Ah, I love myself some Chateau Picard. I'm Unlike uh, Jack here or Worf, uh, for me, Chateau Picard is the piece de resistance, so. (laughs) It is, and it's very tart. (laughs) All right, everyone, we are going to continue discussing Star Trek Picard Season 3 as it unfolds. Today is Part 6, The Bounty. And Matthew, we got a lot of nostalgia in this episode, I would say. It was really fun. We can just jump in, though, with the advancement of the plot, I guess, where we're trying to figure out what the changelings might want, what's going on. We've got Rafi and Worf coming aboard the Titan to fill everybody in on what they've learned and uh, some maybe trouble is brewing in Starfleet's actions in the Great Link back during the Dominion War. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I found most interesting is the way that the plot begins to really thicken here. And so we start to fill in, I think, some of the gaps. One of the things is that, um, you know, you can clearly see that with the Dominion War uh, and with the morphogenic virus that Section 31 had created, it weaponized these changeling zealots. Uh, you know, Shaw calls that out, and I think it is... A, a really good call out in the sense that when you use this type of warfare, you are actually putting and, and giving the enemy a reason to up their game. You know, there's there's that moment in The Dark Knight where Bruce is talking uh, with, uh, I can't remember who it was, but they're talking about the idea of escalation. And, you know, you know, we use semi-automatic weapons that, you know, they get automatic weapons and you you just keep raising the stakes. And in this, you, you, the war definitely raised the stakes. Now, you know, we know the atrocities of the Dominion on the, uh, uh, and, and what they committed during that war. But I love that Worf calls out that there were sins on both sides of this war and the way it was fought. And so... I think what's great there is to, you know, this is one of the things we call out on Deep Space Nine all the time is the way that you would plant a seed or you'd have a dangling thread there and then you just pull on that thread and you run with it. And and one of the things that the writers here have done that Metallus has done with this season is to pull on a lot of those kind of like dangling threads from the 24th century shows that we knew and using them to then tell the story that we're getting here. And so Mm -hmm. that... I, I would say grievous sin of the the Federation there uh, to create this virus and basically want to commit genocide against the changelings. Now, we also give them the cure, uh, especially once we find out that uh, Section 31 was behind this. It wasn't all of Starfleet that was behind right. this. Yeah. So, but it still gives them the quote unquote legitimacy then to do what they're doing now, right? To want to retaliate, to get back at, to 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 get revenge. And so I to even just starting there, I thought that this was a great way of utilizing everything that's come before to now tell a story that we're getting here. Mm-hmm. Well just looking at the morphogenic virus and this Maybe justification why this group of changelings wants to get revenge on the Federation. Do you really feel that that is the plot, that it's that simple? Because I can see a group of changelings deciding that they want to get back at the Federation, back at Starfleet, for having infected the Great Link with this morphogenic virus. But as Jean-Luc says... We did give them the cure in the end, which is not a justification for doing it in the first place, but the changelings were able to rid themselves of the virus. And so I can see a breakaway group 
being like a terrorist group that feels wronged and their mission in life becomes to get revenge mm-hmm. on the other side. But it feels like a simple plot for what we're seeing. I right. just don't feel like that's really ultimately what's going mm-hmm. on. I think it could be a driving factor. Maybe it's what led these changelings to initially break away from the Great Link. But I do feel like something else has happened along the way and that this right. is just an element of it. Oh, absolutely. And and I'm 100% not saying that that is the only mm-hmm. reason because, I mean, oh, sure. what's clear yeah. is is that the changelings are in service of something else. We don't know mm-hmm. what that is yet, right? Whether it's, I mean, it could still be what our theory was with the paw wraiths. We don't know. Could be something else. And so I think that uh, it, it's, it's just nice that we are utilizing as a stepping stone of the story something that was so clearly a part of the previous story. And so I I love that. I, I would say the other thing, Chris, that was really nice here is that we, I think, got a very good answer as to what Frontier Day is all about for these changelings and why they have been working in mm-hmm. Starfleet to bring the entire fleet together at one time. Because we learn from Geordi that all of the ships now are interlinked. Like the fleet is one big fleet that and that they are basically beacons for one another. They're always connected that it's basically like so a starship cell service, you know, like they're mm-hmm. all cell towers now mm-hmm. and they all speak to one another constantly. And therefore, that's why the Titan can't really run is because it's always a beacon because it's always connected. And so. Makes complete sense then why the changelings would one have enacted this, which Jordy has been com- against. He's been sending memos to Starfleet, but you know, who kn- they're not reading those. And what an easy way then to neutralize every ship in Starfleet very quickly by giving one prefix code, right, that shuts everything down. And then once you actually have control of those ships, you could destroy them all and Every person in Starfleet, for the most part, could be dead within seconds, and there would be nothing you could do to stop it. So Mm -hmm. I love that at least this part of the mystery, the idea of what the Changelings are doing with Frontier Day and what their plan has been behind this, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's diabolical. Yeah, that made a lot of sense, and it confirmed something we talked about before, which is that... Starfleet has been compromised at the highest levels, which is stated on the show, but they're, those changelings who are at the top level are coordinating all of this so they can wipe out the fleet all at one time. And the additional element that Jordy introduces that they're all linked now, I thought was, well, it's very interesting for the story. It makes a lot of sense. It's also one of those moments where Star Trek throughout its 50, what now, six, seven year history has always done, which is to comment on issues of the time in which it's written. And like you said, it's like a cell phone system at this point where everything is interconnected and can be tracked. And, you know, that's a concern people have now about are they being tracked? How can you be off the grid? How can you have privacy? And here, how can the ships have privacy, right? And so you can see how the Titan, it's very difficult for them to maneuver and unravel this mystery without being caught because everybody knows where they are at all times. So that part was interesting. And also it made me think of Battlestar Galactica where Adama wants to get rid of all the networking because the Mm -hmm. Cylons are able to track and infiltrate system that way exactly if if all the ships in the fleet are interlinked in some way and so the galactica is its own thing and that idea resurfaces here and uh that was really interesting i did love that geordie says i'm in the middle of my third long memo to starfleet to tell them (laughs) this is a terrible idea to get the whole fleet together and i thought hey geordie yeah that's what i was thinking as well (laughs) But as an engineer, you can certainly see where he would be looking at this. It's it's like an IT security officer these days looking at something and going, this is a terrible idea. 
let's not do this. And Jordy's doing exactly what I would expect. Yeah. Instead of being watched by Big Brother, it's Big Changeling. It's <laughs> watching out for you. Uh, and no, I, I, I 100% agree with you. The, I think this is a beautiful way for Star Trek to comment on our society and this idea of you know, us being so interconnected technologically in a way where, yes, we are always being tracked. We are everything we do. I mean, gosh, you can't go on um, Instagram without finding something that you were just Googling being presented Mm -hmm. to you as uh, something you must buy now. And so, which is, I don't, it's super creepy. I I feel like we're going to get to the minority report of it right you're gonna mm-hmm. walk into the gap it's gonna scan your eyes and be like oh matthew you how did you like those chinos that you bought last time did they work out for you we've got some suggestions for you this week you know it's just like uh, i wouldn't be surprised if that happened within the next 10 years it's it's yeah no i wouldn't either it's, it's pretty sad so uh, yeah. but what's interesting too is that we also know that picard was supposed to give a speech there at frontier day And so the changelings we find out stole from Daystrom Station Mm -hmm. Picard's body. Yeah. uh, His flesh body. And so a question that I have for you, we keep talking about aromatic syndrome. Jack's got it. We know Picard had it, but they keep also making the distinction now that he has a positronic body, so he no longer suffers uh, from aromatic syndrome. So I'm kind of wondering, is maybe the basis for the morphogenic virus aromatic syndrome in Mm -hmm. some way? And they're now creating a version of it that would attack Starfleet and humanity? And and Mm -hmm. is that why this is where we get the Jack connection? And is this why maybe Vatic is so unstable too? Like I'm trying to figure out what would connect all of these things together that, and I'm just going to be honest, that's not the Borg because Mm -hmm. in all honesty, if this show goes the way of the Borg, I think I'll probably be very upset uh, because Mm -hmm. I would find that to be pretty lazy after an entire season two where it felt like we put the board to bed. Um, And Mm -hmm. so with the pieces that we have here, that kind of seemed to be one of the things that might possibly fit in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was trying to think as well. They steal Jean-Luc's body. So they need his body for some reason. He's also supposed to give a speech, as you say, at Frontier Day. And so, are they hoping to wipe out the positronic version of Jean-Luc? Or do they need him as well for some reason? Do they need his body before he was put in the golem? And now they need to capture the positronic version of Jean-Luc as well. And then they're clearly after Jack. They obviously need Jack. Right. So, they need Jack and they need Jean-Luc both for whatever their plan is, it would seem. And so I'm trying to figure out what that could possibly mean. So the idea of it being related to aromatic syndrome and that somehow they're going to use uh, whatever happens with the DNA as a result of aromatic syndrome for some purpose, that could make sense. That could be a possibility. There's also... Like you say about the Borg, I really hope this isn't going down the path of the Borg because I think it can make sense for the story of Jean-Luc. Right. If you just think about the character of Jean-Luc. And it makes sense for Star Trek and for the Next Generation cast. Think back, of course, to The Best of Both Worlds and then First Contact and then everything that we know of Jean-Luc and his connection to the Borg and the fact that we have Seven here, also Borg. And we had all the talk about the Battle of Wolf 359, and that's why Shaw has so much animosity towards Picard. But I don't know. I feel like apart from 
that being an obvious connection as a fan with everything that we know, I don't feel like it fits with the story that we're seeing and everything that is unfolding beyond that. Now, last time on the show, we talked about our idea of the paw rates being involved, which does feel like a bit of a stretch. It would be a bit of a deep cut, but it does line up with a lot of the things that we're seeing. In the Babel Conference, listener Mark White told us that he thinks we're way off on that. So I asked, well, why do you think we're way off? Of course, we might be wrong. And he mentioned that some of his friends and colleagues were saying that Jack might have some Borg nanoprobes in him because Picard was his dad. Now, that makes sense. Yeah, that's certainly possible. And they also said that some of the voices, or one of the voices was labeled as Borg Queen, but then Paramount Plus realized that that would be a spoiler, and so they just changed it to voices. I think he's talking about what we see in this episode, where the data, the android aboard the station says, Jean-Luc Picard, Jean-Luc Picard, Jean-Luc Picard, and then they show the body of that that's what was stolen. Because those voices do sound like the Borg Collective from the best of both worlds. But because I always watch this stuff with the captions on, the captions, I haven't talked about this on the show, but I'm really wondering about how they do the captions because there's some obvious errors in these captions. And I find it a little bit of a stretch to imagine that Paramount Plus originally labeled it as Borg Queen and then went back and changed Mm -hmm. the captions. Maybe they did, but based on the quality of the captioning, I kind of question if that was really the case. And it seems like something that someone would have thought of ahead of time that we shouldn't reveal this plot point. Right. And if they do reveal that, maybe that's not really what's going on, because why would you want to spoil something so obvious in the story? So I'm hopeful that that's not the path that the story is going down right. and that that was yet another moment of fan service, which this season is full of. Mm-hmm. And also it's another red herring to throw us off track, which has been done quite a few times here. So, right. you know, we'll see, but I I want to talk a little bit more about the paw race thing, actually. But as far as the Borg thing goes, I I. It certainly makes sense that maybe these changelings, they want some of the technology related to nanoprobes that might still be in Picard's body as a result of his assimilation. And then Jack also has those and they need those as well. It's possible. Yeah. See, and and I would say too, uh, when it comes to the idea that these changelings have evolved in some way i can't see the fact that they've been able to find a way to shape shift to the ability of creating all the internal organs and basically being able mm-hmm. to fool any medical scanner that does not seem to be an ability that would come from like Borg nanoprobes or any mm-hmm. Borg type technology that seems mm-hmm. more something along the lines that like Paw Wraith type of power could give you in helping yeah. you jump in evolution because you would need more power to me. At least that's what makes more sense of, of a more godlike being uh, for that than just mm-hmm. some sort of interesting techno babble um yeah and so maybe it's well, we could call it theological ba- babble um and yeah. so theo babble there you go <laughs> so i mean it's possible that they need the borg nanoprobes to somehow perfect this recreation of organs although i don't really think that the nanoprobes would give them that ability but you could always make it so that that's the case it is fiction so you can craft it the way you need it about the paw race thing, though, I was thinking about it more, and again, I'm not convinced that that's what's really going on. But oh, I, sure, yeah. But I feel like there are a couple things. Still, at the beginning of this episode, in the recap, they show the head that floats that comes off Fadik's hand. They show that again. It clearly looks like something that's on fire, right? The paw wraiths present themselves as fire demons. And so 
I still feel like there's some kind of connection there potentially because whoever that is, whatever it is, mm -hmm. yeah. it's controlling the changelings and it doesn't appear to be a changeling itself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like a changeling, right, exactly. but it could be. But the other thing is there is a comment that Worf makes in here that stood out to me. Worf tells Picard, we must ensure that Rolaren's death was not in vain to protect Starfleet and her kin. Why does he point out her kin? I assume he's speaking of the Bajorans. Because with the changelings, with the Dominion War, obviously there's a direct Bajoran right. connection there. But he really points out that we have to protect her kin, which again, I assume means the Bajorans. And that just made me feel like where we get these obvious things that seem to be put in to throw us off track. Mm -hmm. This felt like something put in as a hint yeah, to bring us closer to what's really happening with the story, which again, it may not involve paw wraiths, but it seems to involve Bajor in some way. Right. Well, and the thing is, is that I, you know, it's, the idea of aromatic syndrome doesn't really completely explain Jack because even mm -hmm. his bursts of aggression, I'm sorry, but you know, that can't cause a person to basically become Jason Bourne, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and not because it, in many ways, Jack has this like Jason Bourne feel to him where he's able to do things, but he doesn't understand them. And, these visions seem to be much more connected to the actual story that's happening than just mm -hmm. random visions, which to bring it full circle to, to another season, season two, the idea of Jean-Luc's mother who suffered from delusions and visions mm -hmm. that weren't actually true makes much more sense in the fact that then she had aromatic syndrome. And of mm -hmm. course that's yeah. who passed it on to Jean-Luc. Sure. And yeah. Her visions, we know, were not true, right? But mm -hmm. Jack's seem to be very true in the sense of that there is something trying to be brought together. And mm -hmm. he seems to be somehow connected with it because the changelings want him. They continually are asking for him to be brought to them for some unknown reason. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, there is this mystery still with who Jack is what's going on with him how is he connected with the changelings and now we have this question of okay what connects the changelings jean-luc picard's body and jack and then who's over the changelings i mean we we still don't really know and to me mm -hmm. at the moment i'm i'm not convinced it's the case but i you know i the the pod race at least make the most sense at this moment, but you know I'm willing to be completely wrong as long as I'm not wrong about the fact that it's the Borg. Please don't let it be the Borg. <laughs> yeah, I think with our pod race theory, it's not so much that like we really want to be right. It's just we want a story that's more interesting and unexpected, and that would certainly be a twist that would be yes there. And being huge Niners ourselves, we're kind of naturally drawn towards. I mean, as Josh Stone this. said in a song, yeah. you got the right to be wrong, and I got the right to be wrong here. I just hope I'm not wrong about the pork. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, I, I feel like you're right about Jean-Luc's mother. I think she did have aromatic syndrome, and it was passed to Jean-Luc, and now it was passed to Jack, because it makes sense for what was happening to her. What was happening to her could be the result of something else, but just given the family lineage here and what we're doing to connect Jean-Luc and Jack, that this is being passed genetically through the family, it adds an interesting bit of texture to the story and gives you more background on what was going on there. Someone is clearly calling out to Jack, but I'm not sure that it's the changelings themselves that want Jack so badly as much as it's whoever's controlling the changeling. Exactly. So if this floating head, whoever this is, if they are not a changeling themselves and they're the ones controlling the changelings, they seem to be the ones who want Jack. Because mm -hmm. if you remember, Vadic did not want to go deeper exactly. into the nebula. 
to to get Jack. Maybe she was waiting, like, I'll get him later. I'm not going to do it right now. But it wasn't such a sense of urgency for her that she had to go get Jack. But the floating head told her, no, you got to go. You got to go. You know, you're, you're dispensable. You got to go. And then so she went. So there's something definitely more complicated going on there than what it appears to be on the surface. When Beverly in this episode does the brain scan of Jack, she explains to Jean-Luc that the portions of the brain related to cognition and imagination are all affected. But that's another case where I feel like she mentions imagination. I, I don't recall imagination being something that was talked about in The Next Generation with Picard's Eremotic Syndrome. Do you remember that? I don't. But again, that actually it plays into been. season two. Yeah. With yeah. Picard's mother. And so I think maybe that's okay. where they're pulling that part from. Um, okay. Yeah. And it might be. And if so, that would make sense. I felt a little bit like throwing in imagination as part of what's being affected was another way of making us think that, well, all these visions that he's having are just, exactly. he's just imagining it all. You know, we just throw that word in there and try to attribute that to the Eremotic Syndrome. And then as viewers, we say, oh, okay, it's just the Eremotic Syndrome that's causing all of that. We don't need mm-hmm. to worry about that anymore. Now we know what the cause is. But I don't think that's the cause. Exactly. And, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, th- this season has actually done a very good job of creating those misdirections. And I think that that and this itself is definitely a misdirection, that this is not what what's really happening uh, with Jack. And so whatever it is, and I'm sure that we will, of course, figure it out, because they're going to tell us. But I, you know, I, I just don't think that that's what this is. Well, I, I also think that the fact that, spoiler alert, skip ahead 15 seconds if you don't want to hear this, but it's related to this conversation. The fact that the next episode is titled Dominion makes me feel that it's a lot closer to the Changeling Bajor storyline than a Borgwin. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I think it has to be in some ways. Okay. Spoil, spoiler is over. <laughs> um, so, Chris, one of the big things that happens in the episode, obviously, is the uh, visiting of Jordy. Uh, and we get mm-hmm. basically a very reluctant participant in all of this. And one of the themes that we get continued on. Oh, you're talking Jordy. about Jordy. I thought you were talking about Sydney. She was very <laughs> reluctant to participate in the visit to the Fleet Museum. Well, yes, uh, <laughs> but uh, Jordy LaForge is the very reluctant participant in the sense that fatherhood has in- impacted him greatly and yeah. in, in how yeah. he sees the, the galaxy now. And um, the theme, uh, obviously, of fatherhood is is prevalent in this season. We, you know, we've had Will, uh, we've had... Uh, JL, we've had Jordy himself now, and of course, you know, even in this episode, we kind of see Sung dealing with this idea of fatherhood, leaving a legacy, how we deal with our children, and how that ends up changing our life, and I thought that it was, I guess the question I actually had for you with this is, did you think that this worked for the character of Jordy LaForge to be so reluctant to be so protective of his children that he would think that there was any way he could basically sit on the sidelines and he wouldn't face any repercussions. Hmm. That's a difficult question. I, I'm a bit surprised that Jordy would be so hesitant to help Jean-Luc and the rest of the Enterprise crew who he certainly, in the past, saw as his family. And we get that moment here where he has the argument with Sydney, and he tells her that the crew of the Titan and Starfleet, they're not your family. And she says, they are my family. That, I felt, was a bit heavy-handed because it's 
something that we've already been feeling through the whole season, the idea that crews are families. And you and I have talked right. a lot about found families. And there's a moment in here where Seven is talking to Jack and they see Voyager in the museum. And she says, her crew were my family. Mm -hmm. And ever since, and Jack says, you've been trying to find another one, right? And we get the same exchange here between Jordy and Sydney. And I guess Jordy needed that reminder that Jean-Luc and Beverly and Riker and Worf and Data and everyone are his family. Uh, of course, at that point, he thinks he doesn't know Data is going to turn back up. But he needed that reminder uh, to go help. It It's sort of that theme in Star Trek where there is a character who is kind of reluctantly thrust into the adventure and has to help and then finds themselves. But for it to be Geordi specifically that that's happening to here, I did find it a little bit surprising. Uh, I will say as a parent who has raised two kids who are now adults, fatherhood does change you a lot in how you look at things and your tolerance for risk. And I think Jordy addresses that in here when he tells Jean-Luc that all those years, all those adventures that we went on, I never feared for my life the way I fear for hers. And I think that's something that is a natural feeling as a parent, that things that you would do without a second thought you feel very scared or nervous when your own children do it. And it could be something as simple as I was thinking back to when I was in junior high school and outside my house, there was this really steep hill and I would ride my bike to the top of the hill and then I would pick up speed and then I would ride down that hill with no hands on the handlebars <laughs> and I'm flying and I'm not wearing a helmet. It's the eighties. You know, it's like, you know, I, I grew up in the What's age. Uh, yeah, I mean, I grew up in the the time where Jeff Foxworthy has that joke about child seats and seat belts, and how he remembers riding to Florida, yep. climbing up in the back window of the car. Oh, <laughs> right? yeah. oh, 100 percent. I did that too, right? And so I'm going down this hill, but if I saw my own children doing that, I would have an absolute heart attack. There's no way I could not. I would be scared to death that they're going to kill themselves. And I think that comes through here with Jordy that, you know, at this point, he's looking at his children and he just wants to protect them. And he feels like all those adventures are in the past. He tells Sydney that was another time. Right. So I, I get him. I understand. I think that it does read as a little bit odd because we would expect Jordy to be jumping in wanting to solve the problem and solve the mystery. And he ultimately does, but he needs that push because he's become complacent as a Commodore with this job where he just sits at this fleet museum. You know, I, I think this to me goes back to Jack's question of, is there anybody you know who is the same person they were 20 years ago? And mm -hmm. I think that the obvious answer is, is no. We all change. We all grow. We all become different people because life and experience mold us into different versions of ourselves, right? And nothing is more molding, I don't think, and you could attest to this as being a father, and I know many fathers, nothing changes your life like being a father and the responsibility mm -hmm. that yeah. comes with that. And so to see Jordy have become a man who is more worried about protecting his children than he is about anything else and willing to compromise really even himself for that, mm -hmm. I think is in all honesty, and I would say there are probably many fathers who would feel like this having had conversations with some, knowing this to be the case, <laughs> It's hard for them not to compromise themselves in the things they say they believe in when it comes for their children. Mm -hmm. And so I think to me this actually is makes perfect sense. And, you know, we I, I think, you know, the difficulty is is that we don't love it when our, our characters are challenged like this and maybe seem to be less than perfect. But I think one of the things about this show is that 
we are seeing, and, and Picard and, and Jordy have that conversation about the things that we pass on, our flaws and our strengths. And, you know, nobody's ever going to be a perfect parent. And unfortunately, sometimes we pass on more flaws to our kids uh, than we would want to. But we also pass on those strengths. And the beauty here is that Jordy has clearly passed on amazing strengths to Sydney because she's able to remind him who he used to be. Right. And who yeah. he taught her to be. And mm-hmm. in the end, it is her that gets to remind him of that. And what's beautiful is that he's not even really angry at Sydney. What he's angry with is that Sydney has represented the person he used to be and mm-hmm. isn't now. And that actually yeah. frustrates him. And that's what's caused really the tension in their relationship. And and the beautiful thing is, is that Jordy is willing to be humble enough to admit that he has been wrong. And yes, he he does, you know, uh, need to be more on the front foot. Um, he's not scared anymore to step up and help them, his friends. And so, and I think I really like this idea because this does become the question of Star Trek D Space Nine, right? The last episode titled, What We Leave Behind. Mm-hmm. And... This is the question for all of these characters who, as Moriarty calls them, old warriors. They are yeah. old and they have to start worrying about what is it that they are going to leave behind? What is the legacy? But who are the people they're going to leave behind? And their crews are just as much their family as their family is. And I think it's interesting, too, because, you know, Jordy had kind of drawn this demarcation line for him that the crew used to be my family but now I have a quote unquote real family and what we realize is that no it's not just about blood family but it's about found family and they can be just as much family as blood and that's good and I think you know that we give we even get into that conversation with seven right Seven and Jack mm-hmm. have that conversation. She yeah. talks about yeah. seeing Voyager there and that that's where she was reborn. That's they were her family. And Jack says wonderfully to her, very intuitively, seeing that she's looking for a new family mm-hmm. because we are just a little bit disconnected. And what we all long for is connection. And mm-hmm. it's those connections we form that create the better versions of ourselves. So in the end, we get that connection with Jordy and his daughter where she helps make him a better version of himself, which is to remind him who he truly is, not this kind of whimpering, cowering, I've got to try and take... Because he's not actually... If Starfleet's compromised, he's not going to take care of his family by Mm -hmm. hiding in the corner. Right. Because they're going to come for him anyway. Yeah, I think this whole sequence, the conversation with Jean-Luc and Jordi, the glimpses they give us of Jack and Alandra and Sydney and the ships in the museum and then Jack and Seth, like this whole sequence, the dialogue, the visual editing, the way it's cut, the music, it's, I feel one of the very strongest moments of this whole episode because it really, it pulls everything together. It's the very heart of what this whole story is about. And it really grabs you. It's really strong. But a little bit of dialogue that really sums all of this up comes from a different point, which is when Moriarty shows up. And you mentioned him a moment ago, but his whole line is he says, what solvable puzzles you all are. Your unguarded expressions, your visible scars. My, how time has spun you all apart. Such pathetic old warriors. But being solvable puzzles, unguarded expressions, visible scars. I mean, we just see all of that mm-hmm. uh, in that moment that I mentioned. And throughout the, the season, over and over, you see it. Well, and this goes to prove that they were greater together than they were apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I also loved, this reminded me actually a bit of contact. It sounded like dialogue that maybe Ellie 
or maybe Palmer Joss would have said in contact when Jack says, we all long for connection, but we're just a little bit alone, aren't we? Stars in the same galaxy, but light years between us. And Seven laughs and calls that out as a poetic drive-by observation, like something Jean-Luc would say, and that therefore Jack must be Jean-Luc's son. But the line itself, what Jack delivers, I think also is is very true. Uh, but it did, it sounded so much like contact to me that I had to think for a minute, wait, did they lift that line from the movie? <laughs> <laughs> All right. But uh, another thing we can talk about that's still related is when we're on the Daystrom station and we see the hollow projection of the final log or diary entry from Alton Soon, uh, which actually is happening at the same time of the story is all of this. And it also sums up that fatherhood element as well, where he's looking at the attempts of the Soong family really through the centuries to create a positronic human-like being and also trying to pass on you know, the best parts of himself, which he was never like fully successful in doing, right? You know, Data has his flaws, Lore has mm-hmm. his flaws before really just didn't turn out uh, the way the other ones did. And then the, there are others along the way, Data's attempt to create Law, and Law is mentioned here as well. And so even when we're in the midst of this high stakes heist, or <laughs> as they are burglaring the very institution that is pursuing them, which gave me one of my favorite moments in the episode when Riker says, excellent use of the word burglar, Admiral. But even better than Riker's line was Shaw's facial expression. Just an approving nod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) he he loves that 21st century vernacular. So, Oh man, Todd Stashwick's nod in that scene. Ah, it's... 10 star. I love it. (laughs) It's so good. Yeah, it's great. So with being at the Fleet Museum uh, and Daystrom, we are chock full of nostalgia. And there's so much happening here. And just to to name a few things, with Daystrom, we've got Kirk's body. uh, We've got Genesis 2 device. Uh, there is in the background the Thaleron weapon and even self-stealing stem bolts. You've also got, um, of course, Moriarty being there. Uh, mm-hmm. Then at the Fleet Museum, you've got the Enterprise A, Defiant, Voyager, HMS Bounty, the USS New Jersey, the refit Enterprise NXL-1, uh, the yeah. Stargazer. And I'm pretty sure that has to be Kronos-1, right? Yeah, it is Kronos wine, which is so, interesting to have in the museum. Yes. Right? So, I mean, I guess it makes just, sense. Did did you feel like all of these things worked and and became wonderful little beautiful Easter eggs for the fans or did you feel like in any way this went too far? I don't think it went too far, and I think that it's a mix of nostalgia and elements to support the plot that will possibly make more sense later on, or at least help you make sense of what happens in this episode. So it felt a little bit like these are the voyages done right, where you want to write that love letter to the whole franchise and you Mm -hmm. gather well-known elements from all of past Star Trek, but you do it in a way that it feels like just a little break from the story. Yeah. Just that moment to kind of geek out, but it actually is important for the plot. And it's not the main thing that you're serving. It's just, it's just this moment to stop. It gives seven a moment to remember how she was saved by Voyager and how she made a home there. It gives us a chance to remember great stories from the past. I love when Jack just says, well, he says, is that a Klingon bird of prey? And Seven says, yep, that's the 
HMS Bounty. And Jack says, oh, yeah, the whole thing with the whales. Exactly. You know, it's like, <laughs> what? I mean, are we really meant to believe that he knows the whole story about the whales? I mean, maybe, but given the fact that he's grown up outside of the Federation, essentially, and outside of Starfleet, it seems like something that he probably wouldn't be that familiar with, but it also makes perfect sense that he would be. But more importantly, it's important for the plot so that they can get the cloaking device, right? So they can go rescue the uh, people they left behind on Daystrom Station. But it's also wonderful for us because it extends mm-hmm. the story of the voyage home, what happened to that bird of prey afterwards. And I also, the moment that I saw that, and then you realize what the title of the episode refers to, I thought that was really great because of the possible meanings of the bounty. I did not expect it to be the Klingon bird of prey from the voyage right. home. Yep. I could so not agree that was with you more. Quite nicely done. As for other things you see in there, the, well, first of all, the defiant being the first thing that we see, the first ship that we see, it could be as simple as the fact that we're dealing with changelings, and of course it makes sense that the Defiant would be there to remind us of the Dominion War. But then I also wondered if the fact that it's the first ship that we see is further strengthening the DS9 connections to the ultimate plot. You know, it's one more reminder, like the Bajoran Award on Picard's desk at the beginning of the season, Worf's mention of Rose Ken, things like this. Also there, though, we see things like Kirk's, uh, what was that? It's not exactly Kirk's, it's not his body, right? They have... Uh, well, no, I mean, it's, it's his body, I think. Uh, it's it's remains of Kirk. Right, but I mean, it would be the remains from Viridian 3. Right, and, it'd be the remains from there, yeah. I, I think one makes sense because when you think about the idea of like cloning and what happened in Nemesis, Starfleet wouldn't be leaving... You right. know, bodies of its yeah. captain in a place like that. Um, yeah. Of course, too, that that's why they would have Picard's body as well. But I was I was interested in thinking this. So Viridian Three had a population on it, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so there's no way they're leaving remains of a Starfleet captain there, which also means that the remains of the Enterprise D. Mm-hmm. have to have been pulled up right and that has to be what's in hangar 12 yeah 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 and so which yeah you know i i think to me okay if you've taught if you're talking about the idea of starfleet ships only being connected and you you're gonna need ships that aren't connected anymore mm-hmm. So, well, yep. yeah, I mean, come on. You got to be okay. using the Defiant and the Enterprise A and D and stuff like that. I mean, that's sure. got to happen, right? Well, and for this crew, the idea of the D would make a lot of sense because uh, Alondra telling her dad, what about Hangar 12? He's like, Alondra, don't, don't say anything about that. You know, you know this is going to come back up at some yeah. point, most likely, right? And going back to my Battlestar Galactica parallel, the Galactica was... A museum. Yep. Right. And can't you just see Jack commanding the Enterprise A? He loves all those sleek <laughs> retro lines. I mean, the man's got great taste in starships, yeah. which yeah. I also appreciate that we do a little bit of character building with him. That he is like most kids, right? He's a starship geek. Mm-hmm. He loves starships, even before he knew who his father was. So he, you know. Just like many kids in the Federation, you would know the tales of your favorite starships and, and you would have read books about your favorite starships and stuff. So, you know, getting to see, I think all of these things there is wonderful. I think Jack had the whole Micro Machines collection growing up. Probably. Probably did. Yeah. 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 Yeah, playing with um, it there on the Elios. So yeah, okay. So what you say here about Kirk's remains in particular answers a question our longtime listener Mark Rodriguez sent me a few questions DM to me on Twitter. Uh, he chats with me 
from time to time. And one, he asked, why is Starfleet storing the remains of dead Enterprise captains at a facility used for storing secret or dangerous technology? And that, of course, makes perfect sense. Uh, he did also ask me, when are Captain Harriman's remains coming? Do they not arrive until Tuesday? Which I thought was a very fun little joke. Yes, that is nice. <laughs> and uh, then he also asked about the Eremotic Syndrome, which uh, we already talked about earlier. So I did want to mention those things. But what I wanted to bring up about Kirk, the reason I asked if it's not his body is just the way it's displayed on that screen where we see the skeletal system, which makes a great visual. But that compared with Picard's body, which was like the actual body that could be stolen. Whereas with Kirk, we don't have the body, we just have the remains. But Going back to your original question where you asked, do I think that it went a little bit too far? And I said that I think some of the things that we see are there to help the plot. We see Kirk's remains, that screen showing that before we get to the point where we find out that the changelings stole Picard's body. And so I think that helps support the idea that that station is storing the remains of famous Starfleet officers So that when we get to the point when we see, oh, they stole Picard's body, it doesn't seem quite so odd that, oh, wait a minute, they've got weapons and and Picard's body? Mm -hmm. Why? Right. So I think that helps. There's also something that you see on the screen on one of those panels. They're storing a vinculum, which is like uh, this device at the heart of every Borg vessel, which brings the minds of the drones together. And that I also feel like might be there to kind of help keep us thinking this is going down a Borg track when maybe it isn't. It's kind of just in the background. Well, and I think the the best reason to be wary of any kind of misdirection is the fact that Moriarty is here. And whenever we saw the trailers, we're like, oh, he's going to be the villain. And then we realized, no, he's not the villain at all. In fact, he's just part of Data's mm-hmm. subconscious using it as mm-hmm. a security measure there for the Eastern Station. And, of course, mm-hmm. we're, we call back to Counter Farpoint again, we've, which we've mm-hmm. done a few times now in this season. And so... And I also the Moriarty, real- he's not even the Moriarty that was exactly. stored in the- in the cube, he's just being generated by data when data recognizes Riker. And it gives us a callback, right? But at least that's my reading of it. I don't think that the device that stored Moriarty is actually being held in Daystrom Station. I think that's somewhere else. And this was just data. Because even Riker makes the comment, like, this isn't the same Moriarty that right. we saw yeah. in the Enterprise D. Well, and, and, and So that was misdirection for sure. In the teaser. And then it makes sense as to why, you know, again, it's hearkening to something deeper happening. Mm -hmm. And so you can read it on the surface or you can begin to search different reasons why these things are happening. And and that would be one of them, which, you know, speaking of data, we guess apparently now have data Um, Mm 3.0. I was very surprised to see the way in which this happened because it, it felt a lot like the lit verse and the work that Jeff Lang and David Mack had done in the ways that data was brought back in the lit verse there. Nuni and Sung had put together a body that was human in appearance and able to give off human life signs and an even better version of the body that data had had on Omicron theta and Soong had been able to upgrade B4's firmware so that Data's memory sur- could survive. And he was able to transfer him, uh, Data s- successfully into this body that his father actually had, that his father was inhabiting. And he deleted himself, allowing Data to have the full version of the, his body. But all of his memories are still in there for Data to be able to access. So Data became a very different version of the Data that we knew. And I thought it was very interesting that Alton Sung basically does something similar here in the sense that he took this golem that he was going to use for his own body, uh, he'd given it to Picard, and then he decided, well, 
there has to be more in the life than preserving myself. I have to be, if I'm a scientist, I should be creating something new. And so he creates this body that he then puts data in, lore in. Of course, lol is a part of data, B4, and all of them will hopefully come together to create the best versions of themselves. And what we're left with is a data right now who is four different personalities, really, all vying for attention. So apparently we have multiple personality data, and he's pretty schizophrenic. And it it kind of made me wonder, now that he's back, Beverly makes the point of saying he's like you. And I, I kind of wondered, okay, Picard had had a mind meld with Sarek to help him find a way to bring his mind back together. And will Picard have to kind of perform a synth mind meld on Data to help kind of bring his personalities together into one. I I just, I, to me, if you're going to bring back data, this was a very unique and interesting way to do it. Also, again, you're using things kind of from the lit first to do this as well. uh, And things you've used in Picard. So this is a Mm -hmm. way of making even season one better again, because we're pulling this all together. Yeah. I think the way that they brought him back was good. Because before the season, I was wondering, how are they going to bring Brent Spiner back? How are they going to bring him into the story, given that Data is gone and Soong is gone? I mean, they can always create another Soong. We've got a lot of Soongs in the family line. And then in the teaser, when they showed us lore, they make us think, again, great misdirection. I mean, people have criticized the Paramount marketing for spoiling Moriarty and lore in that teaser, but actually, I don't feel like they really spoiled it. I think they did a good job of misdirecting us because Moriarty turns out not to be what we thought. Exactly. And it turns out not to be that somehow lore is back. He's just part of a very complex experiment by Soong that gives us data back in a way that actually makes sense in the Star Trek universe when you play with technology of that time and what we've seen before. And it's not presented as, hey, data's back. It's presented as some rendition of data is back, but it's not him. It's not just data as a whole. He's struggling with something. And then we see how Laura comes into the picture. I thought it was really Fun and an interesting mm-hmm. way to do it. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. It just, it felt, it didn't feel like a gimmick. It actually felt like a, an organic part of the story that evolves out of the first two seasons of this series. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah, I really, I liked that. And the other thing that I thought was interesting about what they did with Data is he's called the Daystrom Android M510, which is not a catchy name. Now, Maybe one connection that I imagine no one has mentioned anywhere is the fact that he's an Android and the Android M510 sounds like a product name that Samsung would come up with for an Android phone, you know, never catchy. But other things that probably have been mentioned somewhere are the fact that we're on the Daystrom station and in the original series in the Ultimate Computer, Richard Daystrom who is the doctor that all this Daystrom stuff is named after. He invented the M5 computer. So there's that connection. Also, uh, last season in Picard, the Borg Queen was being held in cell M510. So you've got a connection there. And then there's a 12 monkeys connection of uh, super virus, right? Called the uh, M510 so you've got the Terry Metallus thing there. So there's a bunch of stuff going on here with this uncatchy Android name. Yeah, I think that's that's great, though, to be able to have those fun Star Trek connections like that, which, again, like you mentioned, makes complete sense for the fact that this is a Daystrom station. It, it's interesting, too, Chris, because 
I had this in another section of the outline, but I think it fits really well here in that the season seems to be talking about this idea of replacements. You know, Picard has been replaced by a synth version, and he's the same yet different. He also mm-hmm. has a son, right? LaForge has children to have, help, you know, replace himself in the universe. Data is now being replaced. He's the same but different. Heck, you know, even ships have been replaced. We ha- we're we replete with ships in this season that have been replaced. We've got the Enterprise A here. We've got the Titan A here. We've got the Defiant A because it's not the original Defiant. It's not the, the Defiant. original Defiant. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, we have all of these ships to which... They're the same. They 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 contain the history of the name, and yet they are also different. And and so this, I think, really leads us to this whole idea. The very first episode of the season was called The Next Generation. Mm-hmm. And this episode, I think, helps us see the next next generation in the sense that you've got Jack and Sydney and Alondra and even Seven and... You have these people who are poised to be able to take over for their parents. And in some ways, they're the same. And then in some ways, they're different. And it's all kind of about the way in which they're connecting, right? And creating connection between themselves and and being a piece of the action in the sense that, you know, Jack and Sydney and Alondra... They conspire, obviously, to steal Mm -hmm. the HMS Bounty's cloaking device so that they can cloak and then they can go back to Daystorm Station and pick up Worf and Rafi and Will with the information that they need. And so I just love the way in which this season is kind of combining these ideas. And I feel like doing it in a way that feels so cohesive and Mm -hmm. really well thought out. That might be the best thing about the season so far is that every episode... I'm not sitting there thinking, well, you know, it's more of everything feels organic and like it fits. It's like when you put a puzzle together and pieces just start falling into place. And that's Mm -hmm. what this season is beginning to feel like to me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, and the, it, doesn't feel like anything's being stretched out. It doesn't feel like we're being uh, derailed. Everything is moving along in a way right. that if you look at it from the idea of replacements, I think, yeah, replacements and also passing along legacy mm-hmm. is maybe how I would yeah, describe it. Because, torch. yeah, because it's not like, oh, you're old, we need to replace you, but it's you're getting older and you are playing a role in the person who will take your place and extend the the history that's unfolding, Starfleet and humanity and such. So that makes a, a lot of sense. And and maybe this will lead us to the Star Trek Legacy spinoff show. Oh, that it better. Has been mentioned here and there from time to time. And one, one thing about Star Trek Legacy is that if you remember Back when, I think it was around when Discovery was being created, Aaron Harvey, who used to do artwork here for the network and did our previous logo, he did a poster of all the potential spinoffs and he had Star Trek Legacy as a show that would be coming up. And here we are coming around to the fact that that might actually be something we get. And I saw a poster of someone, I don't remember who put this together, I saw a poster of it and it had like Shaw... And it had Worf and Raffi, but it also had Sydney and Alondra mm-hmm. and Jack. So it had that idea, like you're talking about, of the next generation yep. uh, moving the story forward. All I can I say to that, Chris, is make it so. Make it so. And also, this is in a sense, I don't know what the age difference is meant to be between Jordy and Shaw, but clearly... Jordy is someone who Shaw idolized mm-hmm. as a grease monkey from Chicago when he was just working in engineering. I love the way that Todd plays 
this moment oh, in the yes. episode so where great. he's he's such an ass to everybody else. He has such disrespect for Jean Luc and Riker, but he just completely crumbles in the presence mm-hmm. of Jordy. Yes, massive hero worship, and it's portrayed so brilliantly. I th- I th- I think it's beautiful that we finally figured out what Shaw's kryptonite is, <laughs> and it's engineers. So can yeah. you imagine how weak need he'd be in Scotty's sight? I oh mean, my gosh. he'd yeah. probably just crumble in a ball and cry on the floor. Um, but no, I, I thought that this was great. Because- what if he gets invited to have drinks and he walks in the bar and Scotty, Jordy, Balana, Trip? Biles O'Brien, oh, they're all just sitting there I, at the counter, and they've got a seat waiting for him. He'd have a conniption <laughs> fit and die just because he wouldn't. His heart would just stop. Um, no, I, what what I do think is great about this though is that I really appreciate the way that this shows how there are people in the Star Trek universe. You know, like say like Jack, they would probably be more inclined to look at a Kirk or an archer, and that would be their hero. But there are people in this universe who their hero is going to be Jordy. Their, their hero is going to be Trip Tucker. Their hero is going to mm-hmm. be Bolana or, you know, any of these engineers, right? Because that's who they are and who they look up to. And so I really appreciated that. I thought it made it really special that we finally kind of got a chink in the armor of Shaw to see who it is that he respects. And it was a fun scene, you know, in some ways he reminds me a little bit of Barkley in that moment where he's like even having Mm -hmm. trouble talking. He's just so enamored with the person staying in front of him. But it was a very human. I mean, as much as the moment was in 10 forward avenues bar where he says, you know, he gives the speech. That's a very humanizing moment yeah. for Shaw. Yeah. This is a humanizing moment, but in a completely different way that I think all of us can respond to if and when you get a chance to meet somebody who's really inspired you or you kind of really look up to, and you're just so, you don't even know what to say. You, you have all the words that want to come out, but none of them come out in the right order. And I thought that that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. You know, I thought it was interesting with Riker, you know, getting caught and the fact that he's mm-hmm. caught in the same way that uh, the Sona uh, use the inhibitor tags, which allows them to lock on to mm-hmm. somebody and or keep them from getting beamed away. And mm-hmm. I love that. So it's a great insurrection callback. But the fact that Riker's captured by Vatic and... She has Troy, which connects with the very beginning of the episode where she says, mm-hmm. look for anyone associated with Jean-Luc Picard. Uh, and mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that leads us, that, and it leaves us on a cliffhanger then for the next episode to see what's going to happen to those two characters and wonder then how they're going to get rescued because Worf says, I, it, they're better. I don't care if there's a God standing in front of me. I don't care who's standing in front of me. I will bring back William Riker mm-hmm. to you, Captain Picard. And mm-hmm. of course, you know, I don't really want to mess with pacifist Worf when he gets angry. So um, <laughs> that was a, a really great kind of cliffhanger there for this episode. And I also loved the moment for Riker when he's just like, 35 years of loyalty, what do you possibly think you could do to me at this moment that would make me give up my friends? But when Troy is there, and we've seen how Jordy has responded to his family in this episode, I do think we are meant to have pause. What will Riker do? Will they both choose to, you know... uh, consequences be damned we're not giving up anything or is there another choice that they might make because they still have a family together they still have kestra Mm -hmm. out there somewhere so Mm -hmm. i i just appreciated the way that this tied into the rest of the episode and the fact that this is kind of a riker reborn he is feeling more alive again. He is feeling more himself than he ever has since his son's death. But now he's put into a position again where he's going to be tested in a way that I don't know if he thought he was going to be tested again. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I like that. I thought that was good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I felt like I had mixed feelings on Riker getting captured just from a writing standpoint because it felt like pieces were put in place to allow that to happen. It didn't feel quite as natural of a flow to me. As a Star Trek fan, it was very easy for me to say, well, of course, Riker and Worf and Rafi will go to Daystrom Station together, as opposed to Rafi 7 and Worf. Why does Riker have to go? Well, Riker, you want Riker and Worf together. It's first and foremost a Next Generation show, and so you want to have them together. But him being the one that goes there. Now, once they're there, you know, the whole the Moriarty thing wouldn't have happened. The music thing wouldn't have happened. Data would have recognized Worf, I'm sure, instead of Riker. But anyway, it's a story. And so you get him there. And then, of course, uh, Riker wants to make sure that they get the android back to the Titan. And so he charges in and he gets captured. But then it gives you that twist of how are we going to bring Deanna into the story. The fact that it's been established early on in the season that Will and Deanna have maybe a little bit of a rocky relationship at the moment that they're trying to come back, Riker's trying to come back to. Now he's put in a situation where he has to rescue her, which is how they will bring them back together and heal that relationship. If you wanted to really make a super drama out of it, you could have it be something where Will and Deanna end up sacrificing themselves to save the Federation and the Rikers die. But given that Worf's already said he's going to rescue them, and given that it's Star Trek and ultimately fans don't like seeing characters they love die in Star Trek, I don't think that's how the season will wrap up. Right. Well, and spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't watched any trailers, uh, but we have seen a scene where they're all around the conference table. And so they're going to find a way out of this. Um, maybe that's a maybe that's a holographic recreation of a previous moment, Matthew. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think so, but maybe. <laughs> maybe. You never know in here. All right. Well, while we're talking about Worf and Riker, I did want to point out <laughs> another of my favorite moments from this episode when they're on the Strum Station and... Worf says, let us continue our search, but tread lightly. We will not be prey. We will be friendly energy. Yeah. And Riker just says, I don't understand the world anymore. The delivery yes. of that line yes. by Jonathan Frakes was perfection. I loved it. So funny. I also loved the moment where Worf is telling him on the platform of the transporter i prefer pacifism and he's like <laughs> we're all gonna die we're all gonna die <laughs> <laughs> i mean and also uh, also so about great. the meditation when Worf says that the most advantageous battle stance is being one within oneself and riker's like really and michael dorn's delivery he's like i just said it <laughs> didn't you hear me just <laughs> michael dorn is just killing it all season with this deadpan delivery yes. of these lines. Or it's, just it's one more Worf wonderful. line when he said, when Riker's like, can you hear me? And at the comm badge, and he's like, he cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and also, we have officially run out of time. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Well, Matthew, what are your final thoughts on this one? And what's your rating? You know, I appreciate that this episode actually is a little bit slower than some of the episodes that we've had so far. Um, I, I think that there's a, an importance in that, actually, of, uh, you know, taking our time and, and allowing these characters to have character moments. And I think that's really important. I also a appreciate the way we got some answers to some of the questions here, but we continue to have other questions. And the beauty is, is that we still don't know. And, and, and it leaves me in a place where... I'm loving the fact that the season has allowed me to be able to figure out some of the story points. And then at the same time, there are other points to which I can't figure out at all. And it's beautiful because it keeps me watching. It keeps me on the edge of my seat every time I'm watching one of the episodes. It also keeps me thinking 
really deeply until I can get to that next episode, right? And I'm on the edge of my seat really wanting the next episode. And so all in all, I'm going to give this nine and a half out of 10 recovered Kirk bodies uh, because I think that this is a fantastic episode of this season. And more than anything, I I put this out on Twitter, but I mean, this this season of this show has reignited my love for Star Trek in a way I wasn't even sure was possible. Yes, I had liked Strange New Worlds. I've enjoyed uh, watching um, Lower Decks, but there's just something about this season that, I don't know, it feels like home, and I'm really glad to be here. And so, yeah, nine and a half out of ten for me. Chris, where are you with this episode? Yeah, I agree with what you said. I think it was well put that it's a season that allows you to figure out some things that are going on, which is a rewarding feeling as a viewer, but it really keeps you guessing about other things and about the ultimate big plot, which is also very rewarding as a viewer. You don't want to be able to unravel everything. And I think that it's very well put together in that sense and very clearly has been well thought out and paced in a way to give you the story in a way that feels satisfying. And like you said, this is, yeah, it is a little bit slower. It gives us time to sit back and revel in all the things we love about Star Trek. And that was one of the promises of the season. And the fact that it's able to give us that while also giving us a very intriguing story is very, very welcome in today's Mm -hmm. world of television in general. So I'm going to give this one 10 personalities trapped in a single Android body. (laughs) It sounds perfect. Well, everyone, we would love to hear your thoughts on the bounty. There are many ways for you to share those with us. Perhaps the best way is to go to Facebook and join the Babel Conference. That is our listeners group. It's there to extend the conversation beyond the podcasts. And as you heard today, we actually referenced a little bit of discussion on the post there for the previous episode. So if you're joining for the first time, please do answer the questions and agree to the rules of the forum so that I can let you in. If you're already a member, of course, you know how it works. But if you need to find it, just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook. It should come right up. If not, type the Babel Conference. You'll find a post for this episode there on the timeline. And you can share your thoughts with Matthew and me and fellow listeners right there. If you'd like to send us email, you can do that as well. Go to our website, trek.fm slash contact. Use the form you find there. Choose to send to a show and choose the artificial tango. And your message will dance its way right over to Matthew and me. And in social media, you can find us everywhere under the username Trek FM. And if your podcast app of choice allows you to leave a rating and a review, we'd love to get that from you as well. And thank you to everyone who has rated and reviewed us so far. Now, Matthew, when you're not making poetic drive-by observations, where can people find you? Well, Chris, that really does take up a lot of my time. Uh, but uh, when I'm not doing that, and maybe you get some of those observations on social media at MattRushing02, Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox, Vero are the places I am most active. Of course, here on the network, I'm also in the 602 Club, which is our general geek show, talking about all of those fandoms outside of Star Trek we love. So we hope you'll check that out. It's a real blast over there. Uh, you'll also find me doing literary tracks about the books and the comics of Star Trek. Chris, you and I are doing the 30th anniversary rewatch of Deep Space Nine on The Orb, the 20th anniversary rewatch for Star Trek Enterprise on Warp 5. We've got Saddle Up about Strange New Worlds, which can't wait to have that come back. And then you could find me over on the Nerd Party Network with two shows. One is called Outpost, talking all about Harry Potter, every single chapter of that series, one chapter at a time, and then Aggressive Negotiations, where John Mills and I talk about Star Wars But Chris, you know, when you're not trying to figure out which voice in your head to listen to, where can people find you? It is hard. I mean, sometimes I'm dead serious, and the next thing I know, I'm laughing like a crazy evil android. You never know. But when I'm not doing that, you can find me elsewhere here on the network, as you mentioned, doing all those shows with you. 
Also, Larry Nemechek and I do The Ready Room from time to time. You can find me in many episodes in the back catalog. And if you'd like to chat with me in social media, my username everywhere is C Brian Jones, letter C, and Brian with a Y. Twitter's where I'm most active. You can also find me on Mastodon on the Trekkies Not Social instance. And I'd love to chat with you there. And if you'd like to help us keep this show and everything we're doing on the network going, we could definitely use your help to find out how to support the network. Please visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. We would not be able to produce these shows and get them out to you without your help. So thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us already. Well, Matthew, it was wonderful talking about Picard with you again today and i'm looking forward to next time where we might be making a little trip into the dominion chris we're all gonna die 